Need your daily fix on mixed martial arts? We're going to kind of recap Bellator 155. From UFC 198. Who's who? Kind of a controversial decision. And who's not? I couldn't figure out why, and then they hit me. Well, don't you fret, because Golden State Media Concepts got, got you covered. covered. Get your daily dose of MMA podcasts. Everything from the UFC, Bellator Fighting Championships, Extreme Cage Fight, and Victor Fighting Championships, and, and, and so, so much, much more. more. Join us as we talk about some of the biggest names in mixed martial arts. We've got you covered here on Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Tune in to the Golden State Media Concepts Mixed Martial Arts Podcast. I'm your host, Tate. And today I actually brought back uh, a really good friend of mine uh, from a couple episodes ago. I have William with me. And uh, strictly because of the fact that William uh, for UFC Fight Night 1, uh, one or actually is 88, uh, his predictions were spot on. So I decided to bring him back and give me to get his predictions for UFC one ninety nine. How are you doing there, William? I am doing well. I'm super excited for these fights that we have coming up. This is going I you know, I really think this is gonna be one heck of a card. I'm really excited about the main event. I'm really excited about the co main event and then I love some of the some of the you know, some of the undercards as well. So we're gonna we're gonna go through some of the like the top the, the top six matches within uh UFC uh, one ninety nine uh, uh, Rockhold versus Brisbane, and uh, I'm gonna get Williams's you know predictions for this show, and then we're gonna and then uh, we're gonna go into some other news as well. Uh, stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. As I said before, I have a good friend of mine, William, with me, who's going to give me his uh, his thoughts. I want to see how his uh, his predictions go for UFC 199, uh, Rockhold versus uh, Brisbane. Uh, so, you ready to go, William? I am ready to go. Okay, so we're going to start from uh, from the bottom and move all the way up to the main events here. So one of the first ones, uh, first matches that I really want to talk about is uh, uh, Brian Ortega versus Clay Guida. Uh, Clay Guida, Guida which uh, is actually fighting out of Team Alpha Male, which actually William actually brought that to my attention, uh, is one of those fighters who's always just full of action. He's always really entertaining. And uh, so let me hear your prediction on and what you think is going to happen in this fight. So Clay Guida versus Brian Ortega. Uh, Brian Ortega is a Henzo Gracie black belt, and he's undefeated, 10-0. and 0. And the thing about this fight that excites me is that the, it's going to be grappling heavy. I know Clay Guida likes to take it to the ground, and he likes to go for ground and pound. But what I'm really excited about to see is if Brian's going to be able to submit him, and I think he will be able to later on. Uh, Clay Guida is getting a little bit older. Uh, he gets he's a little bit reckless, and I think he's going to go and shoot in for a takedown and 
he might get caught in a guillotine or some type of submission along the way. Now, you don't think that uh, Clay will try to keep it standing up and actually make it more of a, you know, uh, a more of a boxing match than anything where, you know, he's he's using his unorthodox, you know, movement. Uh, he's a hard person to you know to, to stay on top of his high energy instead of taking it to a ground with someone who's actually much younger and has a lot more you know and, and you know kind of has an advantage on the ground compared to him you don't think that's going to be a factor he might do that but clay fights with no fear he's not afraid of the ground he's not afraid of standing up and the fact that he's training at team alpha male tells me that he's going to be ready to grapple I do agree with you. Clay is not afraid of anybody. Okay, so you, who are you taking in this fight? I have Brian Ortega by submission, but I can also see Clay winning a grinded out decision. You're kind of hedging your bets here. I'm who taking you, Brian. I'm taking okay. Brian. Okay, we got we got Brian here. Well, I'm going to go the opposite direction. I'm actually taking Clay to win this one. Uh, so we start out the we start out with uh, different opinions here. Okay, let's move on to a lightweight battle that's coming on, which you got Brian Green, or Bobby Green, sorry, against, uh, against uh, Dustin, uh, I never can pronounce the last name. Help me out here. Poirier. Poirier. Okay, so who, who are you taking with, uh, with your thoughts with Bobby Green and Dustin here? You know, Bobby's coming off a long layoff. I've always been impressed by him, especially since his fight with Josh Thompson. He uh, he fought really well in that. But Dustin is also coming off a win of Joe Duffy, the man that defeated Conor McGregor. Uh, he looked amazing in that one, even though he got rocked it a few times. I think that Dustin's going to be more fresh. Bobby's going to succumb to ring rust uh, because he hasn't fought for a while. It's going to be a good scrap. It's going to be on the feet. And I think Dustin wins a decision. I got Dustin winning uh, a decision as well. Um, I, for some reason, I actually see it being a much easier fight for Dustin and this one. And so I think we, we kind of both agree with this one. Yep. Okay, so the next fight that we're going to actually touch on is we're going to actually uh, jump right to the featherweight division. And we're going we're gonna to talk about Ricardo Lomas versus Max Holloway. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say about this because uh, these are two fighters that may not be as well known and may not have, you know, that everyday name. But these are two very tough fighters. Give me your take on who's going to win. I have Max Holloway, no doubt. I got Max Holloway winning and winning early. I got him winning with one, a first-round knockout. What do you have? I have the same. I mean, he's, he's, it's going to be a finish for sure in the first round. Uh, I think Ricardo is not at a great state in his career, and Max is coming off of Terry's on an eight-fight winning streak, and he's just ready to get that title shot. Yeah, you know what? I, I mean, I agree. I think that, uh, you know, he's, he's on, Holloway's on a tear. He has the reach. Uh, you know, he has, you know, I think everything points toward Holloway winning this and winning it impressively. Now, let's get to the big three. The big three matches, and we're going to roll right into the middleweight fight, which, you know, is is one of those things where you have dynamite in both hands with both fighters. We have the the legend... You know the, the the guy who's been around forever. We got Dan uh, Dan Henderson versus Hector Lumbar. What's your take? You know this is a pick 'em fight at, at, in a certain degree because of the power that both men have and the fact that their chins are a question at the point at this point in their career. I mean Hector's coming back. Uh, he fought at 170. He just lost to Neil Magny, and Dan is older now off that TRT uh, his chin isn't as good as it used to um, it's going to be a it's going to be a slugfest I think and you know I, I'm i not sure at this point I, I'm going to have to say Hector because of his age and this point in his career if he, he's going to land one bomb and I don't think Dan's going to be able to take it okay now with this before I give you my uh, my prediction here do you agree that if Dan loses this fight, uh, he's going to be pushed to retire? He should. He would definitely be pushed to retire. I'm not sure if he's going to. It really depends on the fashion in which the fight plays out. But you know, it's it's coming. To, it's coming to that point in his career. I hate to say that, and you know, I've been saying that all week. I hope I'm wrong. 
You know, in my heart, I want Dan Henderson to win. And I want him to win spectacularly just because, uh, you know, UFC's a better place with Dan Henderson on the roster. But I, Father Time is undefeated, and Father Time packs a punch. And for that, I got Hector Lumbar winning and Dan Henderson going down, and I got it going down kind of early. I got a, a first-round knockout here. I don't know about first round, uh, but it is definitely a possibility. But, again, that right hand never fades, and Dan's got one. Talking about never fading, here's a grudge match that seems like it's never going to fade and never going to go away. The Bantamweight Championship where we got the champion, Dominic Cruz, going against his long-time, I mean long-time rival, Uriah Faber. This is this is the rubber match. They they fought once before. Actually, they fought twice before, each splitting. Uh, Faber won the first one. Dominic won the second one. And, you know, you got, you got two guys that are just, you know, pretty amazing fighters with great careers. Let me hear your take, William. You know, my heart goes with Uriah because I've been a fan since his King of the Cage days but at this point in his career I think this fight is going to be a close fight. Uh, I think Uriah is going to test Dominic just as much as he was tested by TJ but I think Dominic edges another close decision as we have seen in the past. Okay, here's my take. Uriah is one of one of my favorite fighters in the in the UFC. Actually, he's one of my favorite fighters in in all of UFC in all of MMA. He's been an ambassador for the sport. Uh, you know, he's one of the more familiar faces, and I would love to see him do well. I really would love to see him finally get that UFC strap that has avoided him. And you know, he's had success everywhere he's gone, and he's had success in the UFC. In the UFC, he just hasn't gotten the strap. So I would love to see him be able to pull this off. But let's be honest, I think Dominic Cruz is just too hard of a puzzle to figure out. Uh, he, he has such a – his style is so different than everyone else. His energy is so high. And unless Uriah can really slow it down, I mean, you can't even kind of slow it down. He has to really slow it down, and I don't think he can. I got Dominic Cruz winning a decision. I think it's going to be a close fight, though. I hope you're right. I, <laughs> I really hope you're right. Um, I hope I'm wrong because I not only do I have him win a decision, I have him win in every round. Dominic's energy is just that, that much higher, and I think uh, Faber is going to have to actually take him to the ground, which I think he's going to have to give up a lot of points and a lot of shots to get close enough to take Cruz to the ground, which is going to cost him a lot of rounds doing having a having a strategy of trying to get to, with having a takedown strategy, and if it's not successful, he's going to lose every round. Your take on that one? I think we're going to go. I think this is going to be a slugfest. To be honest, it's going to be a stand up battle pretty much the entire way, uh, other than the clinch battles as we saw in their second fight. I think it's going to be a controversial decision, and Dominic's going to win because. I know Uriah has been studying him for years. He helped TJ prepare for him. He helped pretty much everyone in his camp prepare for him. He helped uh, Joseph Benavidez when he fought him. And I think he's been planning on this forever. He's been staying around just to wait for this fight. So I think it's going to be a real close fight in that aspect. Um, and I I do think that Dominic's just not going to be there uh, when, when Uriah's swinging and he's missing a little bit. But I think he's going to be able to land some power shots. Uriah is going to be able to land some power shots. But Dominic's just going to do that much more to beat him. All right. Well, we're going to move on to the middleweight division. And I really appreciate it because I think you have some amazing takes here, William. Uh, well, let's go to the middleweight division and the main event for 199. We got Michael Brisbane versus Luke Rockhold. Now... Before, there's a couple of things, and I talked about it on uh, on the show, the previous show uh, last night. Is that uh, number one was something that Chris Wyman said, which was on Ariel Wani's show, which was that Luke Rockhold has the easiest title defense in the history of UFC. Uh, that was the first thing, the worst first bit of news, and I want to get your take on that. And then the second thing, which I just really just shocked the crap out of me was when Michael Brisbane was really hammering, verbally 
uh, hammering Rockhold at the press conference, and Rockhold actually let it slip out that he has a uh, a, a knee injury and he has an MCL tear. Uh, do you think the MCL tear is going to affect the fight? And do you think that Brisbane is the toughest, I mean the easiest title defense in the history of the UFC, or is that Chris Wyman just trying to get back into the the picture? First of all. I love that you call him Michael Bisbane. I love it more than Michael Bisbane. It's just fantastic. And I'm going to call <laughs> I him. I keep doing that all the time. I'm going to call I'm him Bisbane all the time. <laughs> Why do I do that? I don't know. <laughs> He's got a little Australian to him. So, uh, as far as uh, being the easiest fight, uh, easiest title defense ever, you know, there, you can't say that in MMA. You really can't. I mean, Matt Sarah, uh, GSP. Uh, you got a list of fights here where the underdog has just upset him. I, I didn't, I didn't know oh, that TJ I, had it in him I, to beat. I, I thought you were going to say these were, these guys were like easy defenses. I was like, where the heck is he going with this? But I understand. I personally think you can't make Bisbane. Uh, and yes, I keep calling him by the the, the the Bisbane name, but I think he's a guy that will fight anybody anywhere, and he's not afraid. And he's not afraid to take shots. He's not afraid to give shots. And that's the thing that's going to give him a chance is that he's willing to give his and to get some. And so I think that makes him a dangerous guy, and especially when you mix in that knee injury. Uh, go ahead. You know what you're saying? I mean, I totally, I totally agree with that. I'm not I, – I, I love the confidence by Luke. I, I, I dig it. I really appreciate it. He had the same confidence heading into the Weidman match, and he was injured in that one as well, and we saw what he was able to do. Uh, but you don't, you don't want to do that. You don't want to poke a bear. You don't want to keep on telling him things that they don't really need to know. And, I mean, that could, that could be his detriment. I mean, if he's overconfident and he's thinking that he's going to finish Bisping with some punches and uh, just make it as easy as the first fight, he might be in for a rude awakening. I don't, I don't, you shouldn't underestimate anyone in this sport. Now, there's a difference between saying, hey, I got an injury. I got a, you know, a sore rib. You know, I got a, I got a, I pulled hamstring. Um, you know, I, I have, you know, a sore hand. That's a that's one injury, and saying you have a torn MCL is another injury. With that being said, if I was if I was Michael Bisping, one of the things I would do is I would kick the freaking crap out of his knee all night. You know, and you know, I would give some to get some. I would keep hitting that knee and keep hitting that knee until it gave. And I have I don't and I don't I don't. Uh, want to see anyone get injured or anything like that but you know that's you know exploiting weaknesses is part of the game in MMA and you know a knee injury is something that you know it affects your your movement it affects your power it affects your power it affects everything uh, and so I really think that's I, I don't think I would even have this fight if I had an MCL injury I would be backing out of this fight uh, so that's my take. What about you? Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, and it's it's an MCL grade tear, t- uh, MCL tear grade two. So it's pretty close to just tearing off. I mean, grade three is just completely ripped off your knee. And and, and I totally understand that as well. Uh, I understand why he took the fight. He, he's super confident in it. But if I'm Bisming. I'm going to be watching some John Jones videos, and I'm going to learn how to do that oblique kick because that's what's going to really target that knee, and that's what he's going to need to do to get this belt from Rockhold. You know, if that if this happens, that'll be a shame because, you know, the guy who, you know, it's clear that you know Rockhold is the, the far superior fighter, but making poor decisions like going into a fight with an injury like that, this is not a minor injury. This is not a... a, a medium injury this is major and uh you know i just i just think that's a a, a wrong decision on his part i i know a lot of fans will not agree with me but this main event would not be going on if i was his if it was his trainer his manager or even him as a fan i love this type of stuff because Whenever whenever fighters get super cocky, like you watch Will Ronda and uh, and Connor before their devastating losses, that anybody can succumb to that, and people are getting 
And once you start believing the hype and once you start trying to ride the momentum, that's when you're at the most risk. And it might be this point. It might be this point for Luke. I mean, it's early in his run. I mean, this is his first title fence, but he's putting himself in that position, and we'll see how it plays. I mean, it can go both ways. He can look amazing, and I want to see him uninjured. This, I mean, I agree with you. This is this is not his twelfth title defense, or or he's been around for a while, and you know, and he's cleaned out the division. This is this is the first title defense. You, you know, first off, when you have your first title defense, you know, it's a different it's a different ball of wax. You know, you everyone trains a little harder to fight you when you're the champ. Number two, everyone has when you're the champ, you're the main event. You have to handle all the press. There's all this all this pulling in front of you. There's there's so much that goes on to be the champ and to be the main event. That's why so many champs don't make it out of their, their first title defense. And then going into that with a knee injury, that's a big mistake. I completely agree. Um it's gonna be it's gonna be very interesting. Um and at this point you also have to consider the fact that Michael Bisping's not the same fighter that he used to be. Uh, ever since he got kicked in the head by Vitor and he lost his lost pretty much his vision in his eye, uh, he hasn't been the same. And we saw how he fought against Anderson Silva. He actually looked fantastic, but he's gonna need to bring another. He's gonna need to bring it up another lot, another notch. He's gonna need to fight at. He's gonna need to fight above his level. And he might be able to do that. He's coming off a short camp. Apparently, he fights better when he has a short camp. But you're fighting Luke Rockhold. Injured or not, that's that's a risky proposition. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Okay, everyone, we're about to take a quick break. And then we're going to come back with some MMA news in regards to uh, Conor McGregor, uh, Nate Diaz, Ronda Rousey. Uh, stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Okay, we're back, and we're we're, we're going to talk about a little UFC news. We just covered uh, UFC 199 and what, who our predictions were, and for the most part, we were on the same, pretty much on the same page, with the exception of one fight. But now let's talk about a, a little news that has come in. Uh, the first thing is is talking about the fact that you know when I the, the interview with Dana White on on uh, ESPN. Where they were talking about thinking about trying to find another opponent for Conor McGregor instead of Nate Diaz, and one of the things he was saying is the fact that you know they kind of want to go a different direction and have Conor fight someone else. Where they're having a problem where it was because Conor's obsessed with fighting Nate back at that 170. What's your thoughts on the news, and what do you think the solution should be? All signs point to the fact that. Dana doesn't want to pay Nate for that rematch. I mean, Nate got a flat 500 for that fight, um, and he's asking for more because he's he's a draw now, and he's the one that's he's the one that has to accept this rematch, and he's the one that has all the chips on his table. So it, it's very interesting in that aspect. But I'd love to see the rematch. I don't know if I want to watch it at 170 again. But I want to see if Conor is going to be able to defeat him. I think that they both should be at 155. I think that Conor has uh, his ego has taken a major hit, and that's major why. Hit. Yeah, and that's why he's wanting this rematch so bad. But it could it could be 
very risky for him in terms of as a fighter, as a person, and as a business. Because as we know, Connor loves to promote himself and he loves to market. And if he makes another loss, how is he going to be able to defend that? How is he going to is he going to be able to come back from that? Well, you know. The first take that you had, which is spot on, is which it just comes down to the fact that uh, the UFC doesn't want to pay uh, Diaz the same amount of I mean, the money, a little bit more money. But it's not a situation about a little bit more money. Uh, you you listen to the interview that uh, Ariel Wani had, uh, you know, over Memorial Weekend uh, in regards to with uh, with Diaz, and Diaz said flat out, he he feels like he should get just as much as McGregor. Uh, to fight, so he's asking for Conor McGregor money, so to fight in this next fight, which is, you know, ten, twenty times what he got paid the last time, and you know that's a heck of an increase. I don't know if I, if I was Dana, I don't know if I would pay it either. Uh, I love the Diaz brothers. Uh, I just don't think if I have to pay Conor and Nate uh, uh, the same amount. I, I would pass on it, and I'd make Connor uh, defend his title, or you know, and then I agree with you as well that I think the the fight should not be at 170 because Connor could lose two fights at 170, and that would really hurt his career. Where he's not a 170 pound fighter, he's a 145 fighter, 155 fighter. You know, the negotiations with Diaz go back in history when uh, he was still on his uh, Ultimate Fighter contract and he was trying to renegotiate that and they kind of like lured him into it to fight Benson Anderson for the title and he felt... uh, he felt like he was underpaid for that, and he tried to hold out on his contract. And Nate and Dana flat out said that he's not a needle mover. His brother's a needle mover, but he wasn't. He had the lowest ratings on Fox, and he was saying all these things. And now it's kind of coming back to bite Dana. Uh, so we're going to see where that goes. Okay. Let's move on to another bit of MMA news, and that is dealing with Ronda Rousey and the fact that uh, – they were saying that Rhonda is actually she just had knee surgery. She had her knee scoped, and the fact that uh, most likely she will not be fighting. We were everyone was thinking she was going to fight either. Uh, she's UFC 200 is out of the question, but uh, UFC in New York uh, or sometime very soon. And now it looks like uh, the earliest Ronda Rousey will be fighting is in December. But Dana did say that if Misha Tate wins here. Her next fight will be Ronda Rousey. Uh, what's your What's your thoughts on this? You know this trans. This how news that just came out about Ronda having a knee surgery, and that she's going to get a title shot right out the gate. If I'm Holly Holm, I don't like any of it because she was oh, being. Oh, no, she's not excited at all. Yeah, she was being pressured to wait for Ronda, and that was never a guarantee. I mean, Ronda was coming off uh, that was a devastating loss, and the fact that she pretty much broke her jaw in that. And uh, you know, I, 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 I don't want them to hold it off. As a fan, I really don't want them to hold it off. I feel like uh, there's Cat get. Kat Zingano on the mix. There's Holly Holm rematch potentially in the mix. And there's a lot going on there. Potentially there's even Cyborg if she can cut the weight. I really don't want them to hold on. I understand it from a business aspect, but there's so much more to the division that is at stake. I agree with you. I would roll this next. If it was me, you know, if it, let's, make it, let's make it a business decision. Let's make it about money. I would roll into okay. Ronda's on the shelf. I'd have uh, I'd have Misha fight uh, coming up at two hundred, which I think she's going to win. That's my early prediction. And then I turn around and I'm sorry, Holly, but I would skip you, and I would go right to Cyborg, and I would put Misha Tate versus Cyborg for the title. I'd have the winner of that one roll right into fighting. Uh, you know Ronda Rousey when she's healthy, which you would come off with. You could you you know you're you're gonna either have Ronda Rousey Misha Tate, or you're gonna have Chris Cyborg Ronda Rousey. That's what I would do. And you know it's not even a guarantee if Ronda's gonna come back. I mean she's getting some of that movie money. It's nice and luxurious. You don't get punched in the face for it. It might be better. She might get lured away. She might not as be might, might not as be as hungry as she used to. So that could play a role in her comeback. And 
we could see we might not see her in octagon again but i i'm i'm leaning more to the fact that she will be eventually but i don't see it i'm not that excited for it to be honest i'm not excited because of the fact that i'm a ronda rousey fan this is where you know sometimes i have some takes that a lot of people don't agree with but ronda rousey she came on the scene like a comet and then she ended up losing her title I would like to see her, you know, retire as a legend. Just go in because having the well, first off, getting knocked out, the, the nice thing about it is she's been off for a long time. When you get knocked out the way she's been knocked out, you need 12 months to recover. That's the first thing. Second thing is, though, the fact that you had 12 months to recover is you're going to walk into a major fight with either Holly Holm, Misha Tate, or Chris Cyborg as your first fight back. And I know some fighters say there's no such thing as ring rust. Guys, there's a such thing as ring rust. And if I see Ronda Rousey walk in there, and I say any of those three, without a tune-up fight, I love Ronda Rousey, but I got Ronda Rousey losing to any of those three after a year-plus layoff. She definitely needs a tune-up fight. I think throughout, I think if you take anybody else on the division, I think she has a good chance of defeating them soundly. Uh, there, I mean, you take Jermaine Durandamy and um, Amanda Nunez. Uh, I think those are some tough fights for her, but she'd beat them. But as far as the top three that we were talking about before, I think those are tough fights for her. You know, the fight I was actually thinking about as a perfect tune-up fight is a fight where, you know, someone's coming off of a win and wants to get back into the title picture, and that person would be Sarah McMahon. Sarah McMahon just kind of came off of a win. She wants to get back into the, the you know, into the, the, the limelight of, of the women's division. It'd be a perfect tune-up fight for Ronda Rousey. I just don't like Ronda Rousey going in cold after being off for a year. I think Sarah McMahon would be the perfect uh, tune-up fight. What about you? As far as perfect tune-up fight for an easy win, I definitely agree with you. <laughs> That's why I think Dana, they would consider that one, you know? Oh, yeah, I totally agree with you in that aspect. But as yeah, No one, I, up, no one wants to upstate the apple cart now. Come on. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, Ronda's a draw herself, and drawing power wouldn't be a problem. But in far, as far as a fan, I wouldn't watch her fight someone new. This is true. And, and, you know, and that's one of the reasons why they want to put her in against a major uh, fighter is because that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a pay-per-view event on its own. Ronda Rousey's comeback, you know. So, just saying. Now, with that, uh, we're going to cover one last bit of news. Um, and this one's kind of a heavy one for me. Uh, and that is uh, the greatest of all time. I know we're an MMA uh, show, and we talk about mixed martial arts, but the greatest transcends all sports, and that's Muhammad Ali, and they announced today that he is on life support, and the family doesn't think he's going to be around much longer. It could be any, any time now. Um, he meant a lot to me. He was, a, he was, a, he was a, an icon to my, my dad. He was an icon to me. He was an icon to a lot of Americans. Uh, and, you know, we're pulling for you, uh, champ. We, we send you our love. Uh, what about you? You got any, any statements on that one? I mean, he was definitely past my generation, but I, as a, I've, I used box in, in the past, and he was definitely a, a role model for me, even as a person, and especially as a person. I mean, the cultural impact that he had and what he stood for, I've done a lot of research, and I've watched a lot of film on uh, Muhammad Ali, and I am a huge fan, and it just saddens me that it's come to this point. He gave everything to everything that he was involved in. All right, with that, we're going to wrap things up. Which, uh, like I said, we're, our, our thoughts and prayers go out to uh, uh, the Champs family. And uh, thank you for tuning in to the Mixed Martial Arts Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Tate. And you can, you can follow us on, at www.gsmcpodcast.com. You can, uh, you can also, for social media, follow us at, on Facebook and Twitter. Or you can download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Google Play. Thank you, and good night.